Tengu again from Capital Dynamics. Uh, so sorry last week, uh, I couldn't make it. Well, partly because I had to go to Melbourne and also the timetable was extremely tight and I wasn't feeling that well either. So here we are. Uh, good to see you all again and uh, hope you subscribe to our channel, like our channel and share, please share with them because you'll find that many times the videos that we do, uh, it's not just about making more money, creating more wealth for yourself. Very often it's about making the country a better country, making the world a better planet. So the more we can share uh, this sort of uh, positive values, positive messages, the better the country will be, the better this planet will be. And for today, I think uh, it's an extremely important topic, an important matter that all relations should think about, reflect, and take the necessary actions and behave in an appropriate manner. I think let's take a look at a photo, which obviously uh, it's very touching. I'm not sure whether you've seen this photo, it's got pretty viral, and it's a photo of two young Malaysians going to school on their first day. And the best part is both of them are holding hands. And what happened was, I mean, according to the media report, is that the, the lay girl was very nervous and sort of crying. And then this Chinese girl just came without any point asking her to do it very spontaneously came and held her hand and reassured her. And after that, the two of them attended the school for the first day. I think this is... I wish I had seen this uh, in, a, in a video form where you can actually see them coming together. But even in this photo, a still photo, it really touches one's heart. And for relations, those of us who believe that this country is really one of the best countries in the world and must be preserved and built at all costs, it's really inspirational, it's really motivational. Uh, I mean, obviously they're very young and obviously I'm at the other end of their age profile, I'm 70, but I find them to be my role model. Uh, I think to, to be 70 years old and then find role model in these two young generations, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a lost for words. The, Message, I hope, of these two Malaysians, to these two young, wonderful Malaysians, the message from them is that, look, we are all Malaysians, and I think the most important segment of the Malaysian society that should hear these people, that should reflect upon the actions that these two young Malaysians have taken would be our Malaysian politicians, whether in the opposition side, whether in the ruling government. Malaysian politicians, if I could share with you a survey, a result of a survey, it says that Malaysians, Malaysian politicians are the most racist people in Malaysia. And the results, if I can share with you the results, I'm not sure whether you can see the screen. Uh, trends of racism, racial discrimination and xenophobia 
from 2015 to 2013. And this is uh, based on their report, which is Malaysian, Malaysia Racism Report 2023. If you can see, uh, I hope you can see the color because the different columns are actually shades of grey. You know, if you can see uh, in politics and in uh, in the other categories, you find that in politics, uh, trends of racism, racial discrimination, and xenophobia is the highest, and they typically spike up when elections are held. 2018 and 2022, you can see the two pillars that are spiking up in those two election years. And it's not surprising because you notice that in the past, you have uh, banners being torn, uh, racist towns, and a lot of hate culture being uh, used in the general election campaign. In the other situation, you notice it's the same, right? Where they purposely use the issues of ethnicity, they purposely try to divide the Malaysian uh, different communities over racial issues, religious issues, cultural issues, the hit of elections, in this case, this of state election. So the trend is that politicians, Malaysian politicians on both sides of the spectrum love to use this issue. It is unnecessary. It is totally unnecessary. Malaysia as a society, as a nation, as an economy has so many other important issues to deal with. And for you to win votes, it's not necessary for you to go down the path of creating disunity, creating uh, mistrust among the different races. The economic, the social issues, the climate change issues are already so important that if Malaysian politicians can address them intelligently and solve these problems cleverly, they would be able to win enough votes without having to resort to this hatred type of uh, hatred type of messaging. You know, Malaysia has always been a land where rich cultural and religious diversity existed for centuries. Hundreds and hundreds of years or even thousands of years. And to deny, to deny Malaysia's rich past, to deny our rich past is to deny relations to a brilliant future. I would definitely want to think that there's still a clear path for all Malaysians to travel on. A clear path where all Malaysians, whatever your background is, your ethnic uh, background is, your religious background, your religious beliefs, whatever they are, all of us, all the Malaysians can travel on this path that will lead to a better country for all Malaysians. I was in Penang recently and uh, I purposely went to Butterfringi because I wanted to capture something that maybe um, many Malaysians are not aware. I will play this video with you, but what I was trying to do was, here I am on the beach of Butterfringi and uh, Imagining myself to be coming from India, from the South Indian continent, from Middle East, centuries ago. And if I'm a Muslim trader or an Indian trader coming to this part of Southeast Asia, the Malay Peninsula, I would have been on the sea for weeks. 
and I would be wondering where is land? When where is the next place where I can rest and then get new supplies and continue my journey? So the first thing that this traders would have noticed and this is like a long long time ago would be Gunung Jarai or in English we call it Kedah Peak Gunung Jarai is the highest mountain in Kedah and it's about 4,000 feet above sea level and these uh, traders who come through the maritime routes the first thing that would have given them an indication that there's land ahead would be the site of Gunung Jarai. In this video of mine, uh, it's unfortunately because the distance is quite far from where I am, where I was, and I was only using a headphone, so I cannot really capture the actual image of Gunung Jarai. But nevertheless, I support pause and imagine, let you imagine what it would be like if you were coming from the Indian Ocean, from the Andaman Sea to the northern part of the Malacca Straits. The mountain over there is Gunung Jarai or what we call Kirati. So this is the first and the travelers the maritime travelers from India, uh, Sri Lanka, from the Middle Eastern side, and then they cross the Andaman Sea. The first view of land is Gunung Jarai. It's what they can see from far away. So that's why we look at the history of uh, Malaya. We Civilization, there was a civilization built at the foothills of Gunung Jarai. The Lankasaka, the Sri Vijaya, because the navigators, they saw the mountain, then they could land there and build a civilization there. But in Kedah, it's called the Bujang Valley, but unfortunately, our Malaysian government has neglected the Exploration and development of the Bhutan Valley because, uh, I'm going to again, the cynical reason is that the Malaysian government doesn't want to show that the history of Malaya is not just about Islam. The history of Malaya, the Malay Peninsula is also filled with Hinduism, Buddhism, and a lot of other different cultures and religions in uh, a long time ago. This is about a thousand five hundred years, a thousand eight hundred years ago. And in the Bhutan Valley there are still archaeological evidence of this civilization. In fact, recently they discovered a pretty large Buddhist stupa in Bhutan Valley, well preserved. Uh well, the the stupa is in very good shape. And the large one. And that is one of the archaeological evidence that Hinduism, Buddhism came to the Malay Peninsula, to the Malaysian Peninsula a long, long time ago. So why? Why am I showing this? Because I think if you look at uh, the history of, of Malaysia and Malaya, when I say history, don't just talk about after 1957, because our history stretches back a long, 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 much, much further than that. And what was reported recently is that archaeologists in uh, North Malaysia, in Penang and Kedah, found that their malicious past was multicultural, multi-religion. And this is not just a guess, they found solid evidence. 
Okay? When an archaeologist cleared the vegetation atop this Bukit Choras, Bukit Choras is in Kedah, in the Bujang Valley, they discovered a Buddhist stupa in good condition, excellent condition, right? Now, according to this article came from Al Jazeera. According to the Al Jazeera article, the stupa was isolated in the northern side of Mount Jirai or Gunung Jirai, unlike the other 184 archaeological sites discovered in the Bujang Valley in Kedah. Right? Nasha, who is head of the archaeological team, said the stupa measured 9 meters long. That is about 30 odd feet. That's, that's very long and big. And it is the most important discovery Right? Because the statues of Buddha were found in good condition and they were found in areas that have not been found that didn't show this type of archaeological evidence before. And according to the archaeologists, this uh, statues was thought previously was thought to be found only in Java and Sumatra and Indonesia and India at the time. But now they discovered that it also existed in the, near the Bujang Valley at the foothills of Gunung Jirai in Kedah many, many, many centuries ago. Can we? This is it. Uh, Nasha Rosila, who led a team of scientists to unearth the Bukit Jorah Stupa. So, the Bujang Valley it's actually also linked to the Lankasuka, Sri Vijaya, where ancient king kingdoms in modern Malaya. And the Bujang Valley showed that an ancient civilization once was thriving there. And this was known as the ancient Kedah Kingdom, which prospered between the 2nd and the 14th century. Of course, there are ups and downs, up and down, but Nevertheless, it lasted around that period. And this kingdom predated the arrival of Islam in this region and stretches from the northern part of Malaysia into Thailand. Right? And ancient Kedah was, uh, well, I mean, it was a rich and prosperous place because there was a lot of trade going on and the traders, uh, from South India, Middle East, and then the traders from China would be able to transact in this area. And it was a community where it was multi-religious and all kinds of ethnic communities lived together without fighting one another. Right? In fact, there's some evidence to show that the population of uh, this area was as large as what was found in Malacca during the 14th, 15th century. So the archaeologist Nasha suggested that the findings in the area suggested that traders from China, India and the Middle East came to Kedah, the Bujang Valley, to do business. And they have to, because at that time you don't have steamboats, steamships, you only have sailing boats, sailing ships. So they will have to spend and stay for a prolonged period in Kedah because then they have to wait for the monsoons to change so that they can use the monsoon winds to go back or come back again. Right? So Kedah was thriving, multicultural, multi-religious, and nobody fought against one another. This evidence, this fact about North Malaya, North Malaysia being a thriving global community, is not just from the archaeological findings of uh, the, the one that Al Jazeera reported. The travel records of the Chinese Buddhist pilgrims 
starting with uh, Fasen. Fasen was around 402 AD. And then Suen Chan is the more famous one who traveled around the middle of the 7th century. And then Yi Ching. Yi Ching is the later part was about 30, 30 odd years later than uh, Suen Chan. But uh, Fasen and Suen Chan took the overland route. That means the travel from Chang'an or Siyan now into the Gobi Desert, into Afghanistan, down to northern India, Nepal, and then down the way all to Sri Lanka, and then went back. Now, in the case of Yi Ching, what is interesting is he took the maritime route. If you look at this map here, where you can see the dashed line, because Yi Ching started from Guangzhou, he left by boat in Guangzhou and came down, sailed down all the way to what is modern day Palembang in Indonesia. Because at that time, uh, Palembang was at the center of Buddhism. It was a very uh, rich, thriving uh, Buddhist based type of kingdom known as Sri Vijaya. And this Yi Ching from China traveled there and after that went up. If you notice uh, on the map there, he went up to stay in Kedah. Right? Can we just take a look at this? This was uh, when he, he lived and then he traveled, like I said, 30 40 years later than Sui Chang, but using the sea route instead of overland. So, in this case, what is interesting is this. He arrived at uh, Sri Vijaya Panama and he stayed there for six months learning the Malay language and the Sanskrit grammar for him to be able to translate the Buddhist sutras into Chinese. And then from there, he went on to visit the, what they call the Malayu Kingdom, right? And Keda, or in this case, Keta. I'm not sure you pronounce it, Keta. Now, all these are not speculation. All these are facts because the Buddhist monks of uh, Fasien, Suenchang, and Nichi, when they travel, they wrote down all their travel details in their diary, in their logs. So these are all very well documented. And the, the, the travel logs are still in existence. So you find that uh, these are not just speculation by some scientists or archaeologists. These are actually recorded, right? And Yi Ching recorded his, his impression of the Kunlun people. This is an old ancient Chinese word for the Malay people. And he says Kunlun people have curly hair, dark bodies, bare feet and wear sarongs. I think the part that reveals the most is wearing sarong. I think uh, we know for sure that he is in the correct part of the world and he was describing it accurately. Okay, this is from the archaeological findings in, uh, around Gunung Jarai. This is from the travel writings of uh, the three very famous uh, Buddhist monks which is about, first time was 402 AD, that's about 1,600 years ago, and Yi Ching is 600 plus, that's about 1,400 years ago, that's a long time. So Malaysia or Malaya has been having this very rich multicultural past for, for a long time, long before any of Malaysian politicians were born. More interestingly is the next fact that I want to share with you. This is, uh, this research was published in 2011. And if you look at the authors, right? Wanisa, Abdul Rajab, Muhammad Khairi, uh, Suhua, Li Chin, and so on and so forth. There are about 8 or 10 of them. And these are all scientists. Like for example, the two Wanisa Hatim and Abdul Rajib were attached to the 
Human Genome Center in USM School of Medical Sciences, and then the Chinese, the Li Jin and Suha were based with the Chinese Academy of Sciences and based in Shanghai and the Shanghai Institute for Biological Sciences. So what is important about this research publication is that this is, I think, if I remember correctly, this was the first time where uh, DNA studies were made of the Malay uh, ethnic group in Peninsula Malaysia, in uh, West Malaysia, right? This is the first time, and now, this is not speculative, this is not hearsay, these are all based on DNA, genetic uh, research, which, if you know, is something that cannot be um, how would I say? It, it's not hearsay, it's not a rumor, it is as scientific as you can get. I mean, DNA, genetic evidence can be even admitted as evidence in court, in court cases. So here, we have a huge bunch of scientists, genetic scientists, who actually studied the structure, the genetic structure of the Malay community in West Malaysia. And what is surprising is that if you look at this table, right, you look at various samples of the uh, Malay, Malaysian Malay in Kelantan, Minang, Jawa, Bugis, right, where the location were in Kelantan, Degri Sembilan, Johor, and then the Proto Malay, which is uh, the location was Negri Sembilan, then the base on the Negrito, which is based in Perak, and Kedah, and then you have the Indonesian Malays, which you divide to Melayu, Java, and Toraja, which are the, what they study was the population from Sumatra, Java, Sulawesi, and then the one which is, should be of interest is the Chinese. These were based, located in Yunnan. Right, so you have 29 samples from uh, one uh, this category called Juno, and then 56 samples from this category called War, and then it goes on, and goes on. So what is interesting is that from their genetic uh, analysis, you notice we have the, the four boxes inside there, the three clusters, but the three clusters are further divided into four boxes, right? If you notice in cluster two, right, you have the CN, CN, JN, CN, uh, WA, that is the Chinese cluster, right? That means this tree, this genetic tree is telling us that the Malay ethnic group has got very diverse origins. That's, that's how, that's how rich the Origins of the Malay community is they did not come from just one source, they come from multiple sources. And one of the sources actually came from Yunnan, China, which from my other readings doesn't surprise me because from the other readings I made is that um, this was during, for example, the uh, Yuan dynasty. Yuan dynasty is after the Song dynasty. It was around the 12th, 13th century. At that time, there were a lot of Muslims who were traveling from Chang'an, other parts of China, into Yunnan. And then from Yunnan, quite a lot of them came down to uh, the Malay Peninsula. So from reading from various sources, I can say that what the geneticists have found out that as a cluster of Malays, that originated from southern China is actually uh, verified through other methods, through other approaches, right? So I think one can say that the, uh, like I mentioned, the cluster one, cluster two, they show Malayu Bugis and Malayu Minang show that they got close genetic ties with the Indonesian population. 
in cluster 3, the Malayu Kelantan form a separate group by itself. In cluster 2, the one I just explained to you, the Malayu Jawa were more genetically related to Proto-Malays and Chinese than other populations. So, as I said, the sources, the genetic sources of the Malay community is very rich. Uh, it could be true migration, it could be true intermarriages, and so on. Right? So, if you look at it from the archaeological findings in Bojang Valley, uh, the travels of the Buddhist monks and their records, and this genetic study is simple. The conclusion is simple. Malaysia has got a very rich cultural, religious past. And there have been a lot of interactions among the different communities without any kind of uh, conflicts, military conflicts, or wars, and so on. So I think let's come back to the point that I made at the very beginning. At the start, I show you the back of the two young Malaysians. This photo shows you the front of these two lovely young Malaysians. The Chinese girl and the Malay girl holding hands so naturally, you know. Maybe it's natural, it's so natural for these two young Malaysians to become friends. Why? Because maybe they share the same ancestors centuries ago and were and are in a way related all this one. So if that is what Malaysia is, then isn't it time for Malaysian politicians? on the opposition side, on the ruling government side, to wake up to Malaysia's real realities and to stop using race, religion, ethnicity to divide us. Because genetically, the genes are inside all Malaysians, that we are all the same people. So my message from this video is to reach out to you who have watched this, to share this video because a lot of the things that I shared here, they are all facts. They are all fact based. I didn't create the archaeological findings. I didn't create the genetic study. I didn't create the travel logs of the Buddhist monks 1,500 years ago. It's all fact based. Share that so that more Malaysians, whatever your ethnicity is, will know that we are a united nation. And then to let Malaysian politicians please wake up. It is not too late. It is not too late for Malaysian politicians to wake up and accept that look, let's from today onwards stop dividing this country, stop using this divisive issue of race, religion and ethnicity and then move on. Because at the end of the day, Malaysia is, like I said, one of the most beautiful countries in the world. And it can even be better if only our Malaysian politicians can build this country on sound, solid foundation. Okay, I hope you uh, find what I said useful. And please subscribe to our channel because we will talk about topics, not just about dollars and cents. We will talk about topics that will create positive values, that will create a better community, a better planet for everyone. And with that, I thank you again and have a good weekend. Bye-bye.